know because enough should know now that if something's wrong, we'll fix it. It's a model, after all. It's not a dogma. It's not here to say that everything that is being presented is, is without flaw. It's about a model, an idea, perfecting an idea. So hopefully that answers that. Yes, excellent, Frank. Thank you for that. We'll get to the phone lines with uh, Darlene, 99. Darlene, 99. You there? Hi, yes. can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. hi. hi. Um, I just want to say um, I really appreciate um, Eucadia, and I want to thank Frank because today I had an opportunity to utilize the skills that I've learned and been studying, um, you know, on um, Skype, I'm known as Ormus, and so today I had a court case because um, I've been dealing with um, a custody issue and um, child support, and so um, when I first um, submitted my documentation, the clerk of the court kept um, rescinding them, sending them back to me, and every time he had a different statement in the body of the letter, the last one he used, it said that he's slightly recognizable within the unusual documents attached is this court case number, and then he said that I should um, point this out or present any documentation necessary for the adjudication of the case, and then he said all your original documentation will neither acknowledgement nor acceptance is returned, and then he further went on to say the appearance of your documentation is one that presents your fingerprint and what appears to be possibly be blood. And if this is indeed the case, please be advised that the court has inquired with the United States Postal Inspectors who relayed that such an action without the appropriate packaging and biohazard laboring is considered non-mailable and that you are not permitted to mail these items in the future. Continuation of mailing such non-mailable items can be can be led to federal criminal prosecution and civil fines and penalties or both. That did not discourage me. I still submitted my documentation. So when I went into court today, I looked the judge in the eye and I let him know that I was a trust recipient. I stated my number and I told him that I was known in the form of Darlene Annette Randolph and I told him that I was here by special appearance to resolve this matter respectfully and to, uh, I asked him if I could enter his bar as holder of my own title. And I thought that he was going to give me a very difficult time, but he didn't. And uh, I kept bringing him back to the point that we need to discuss determination of jurisdiction. And so finally he asked me, he said, well, ma'am, for the sake of uh, the court, can I just call you Miss?" Ms. Randolph, because I know I'm recognizing you as this trust recipient person. So uh, we're making grounds, and to to sum up the uh, entire story, uh, I had the case, two cases dismissed today. So that was my well win-win done. today. Well done. Look, it's it's we've spoken about different things over the over the last few weeks, and we've spoken about the trust recipient number, we've spoken about the fact that you're a tribunal of persons, we've spoken about the prayer, there's there's all the different things. But at the end of the day, the most valuable tool you have is the knowledge when applied competently as you did today and knowing who and what you are. Look, there is no perfect formula to go to court. There really isn't, as you know, yeah? Mm -hmm. What you Correct. What you thought what you thought you knew will always be different. You might have thought the judge to be the worst, and they're not. You might have thought the judge to be best, and they're not. But over time, what's going to happen in these courts is when more and more people come in honour competently, like you did today, like many people, more and more people are doing, that over time, they can't withstand that. And it really forces them either to become purely uh, brutal, in which case the, the, the general public will see the change, mm-hmm. or they have to reform themselves, which appears to be something that they find impossible to do. So that's great news, and I, I'm really pleased that, that you are finding the information helpful, and I, I'm sure that not just in the matters that you're dealing with, but in your whole life, I hope this is helping you with everything that you're dealing with. Yeah? 
Oh, it definitely is. And I just want to encourage everybody to continue to just study because one thing I know, uh, if you stand before them and be very confident and you know what you're saying in your heart, um, they will know if you're serious or not. Because when I asked that judge today for his bond, his oath of office, and his liability insurance, and I asked him to restate his oath as an independent judge, I mean, he almost fell through the floor today. And so he knew that I was not playing with him, and he knew that I was going to take it to the next level. Yep. So. Well, thank you so much for that. And, look, not every action in a court is going to be successful because we're dealing with people who are thieves, liars, and and insane, but occasionally a a ray of light comes through. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Also, uh, after tonight with the prayers, there's further empowerment uh, given to everyone that's going before these, uh, the courts and with issues that uh, anyway it, 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 you'll see a major difference uh, in how absolutely that's mm-hmm. some new experiences alright we uh, go back to Ron real quick on the phone Ron you hi, hi Frank again um, hi Ron in the, the book of the green race there are no less than four or five uh, natural disasters that uh, that you've recorded in the book, you know, like uh, meteor meteor showers, large earthquakes, stuff like that. It yeah. appears as though there are quite a few episodes of meteorites hitting Earth, and and that's what destroyed Bellback. Is there is there a certain timing to to these uh, meteor showers, like? Yep. Yeah. The, the tail of Planet X or Alien or uh, do you know what the timing is? Is, is it like yeah. thirty one seventy years something like that? No, no, no. It's it's um, because the comets uh, comets come in a, in a in a asynchronous pattern. I mean, there are Halley's comet every ninety plus years and 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 various ones that that come through on a regular. I think it's less than ninety years, sorry, but on a regular basis. Um, you can pick some of them, but they're in a cycle of, of 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years. Uh, the density of meteorites attached to a comet is a function of the intergalactic uh, medium that our sun passes as it moves um, as part of the structure of the of the arm of the Milky Way. So one of the things that we don't quite have in science yet, because science being such a wonderfully arrogant body, sadly, but such a wonderfully arrogant body, is the way to view our sun in relation to other stars is cells of a body. And that the interstellar, uh, the interstellar medium in that structure is really holding them together around pipelines of hydrogen. But then those structures move collectively. And the reason that they stay in place is that the gravitational forces of the galaxy are so great in order to maintain the integrity of a galaxy Mm -hmm. that if there was an independent movement between the planets themselves, the galaxy could not exist. It's impossible. The forces could not function if the stars themselves also moved freely within the uh, galactic arm mediums of a a galaxy. So they're held in place, well, virtually like a massive version of cells. That's the most beautiful, wonderful, spiritual realization is that stars are connected together like cells of a body. And that a galaxy is is like, well, it looks like a starfish. It's like a like a multicellular organism. But as we're moving through, there is a uh, pockets of uh, dense meteorites that actually um, 
cannot be stopped by the ought uh, spherical um, chain mesh is probably the best way to describe it, uh, exterior of our sun, which is the outer boundary of our cell. And the Oort clouds are designed to pretty much stop large bodies from coming into the cell and disrupting the function of our stellar, uh, solar system. But meteorites that are 5 kilometres, 10 kilometres, even 500 metres across are small enough to slip through. So when we come into that kind of medium, uh, certainly on the outer edges, uh, it, it allows comets that are effectively going to the edges of our solar system to collect those. Now, ordinarily, as those meteorites filter in, in in swarms of their own, if there is no comet, they will be collected by four massive bodies, the Javians, that have such huge magnetic fields. Most of these meteorites are, are, are iron or silicate, but the majority of meteorites uh, iron based or metal based so they'll be collected by those Javians and hence they have those rings because they're constantly collecting meteorites over millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years mm. but when we go through a period of, of, of higher density or more dirt, you know, like more meteorite dirt as, as we turn with the galaxy it means that the density of meteorites at the back of a comet's tail can dramatically increase. Now we've gone through a period, a drought, if you like, of experiencing what has been certainly a feature of civilization from seven, eight thousand BCE to about probably eighteen hundred uh, years ago. And that is Whenever a comet came, our ancestors feared it as an omen of death because six, seven, eight, twelve, fourteen days after the comet uh, left on its cycle, the meteorites would hit the earth and it would and it would be like clockwork now in the last eighteen hundred years certainly since science has been studying comets, they've come to the conclusion that there's nothing being attracted with these comets and that all the fears of our ancestors on comets was really because they didn't understand what they were. No, they understood exactly what they were. It's just that we have gone through a period of drought. Now, that drought is due to end at some point. It may come with Elenin. It may come with the next comet. But when it ends, what's going to happen is that we're going to see severe meteorite showers. Now, what does that mean? It means, well, a heavy meteorite shower. It means we could see 800 bus size meteorites coming in and hitting a wide area of the Earth. 800 buses could come in, uh, bus size meteorites, and hit the Middle East, or hit part of America, or fall in the ocean, or hit Australia. And that's what they've done over centuries. And when that happens, there'll be some that say, well, it's the end of the world, because, you know, it's, it, 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 it's going to be scary. But it's going to start happening again, and that's part of the cycle. Mm. So, yeah. Okay? Um, <clears throat> getting uh, the, earthquake, the Japanese earthquake, Tilted Earth by four degrees. Um, that was that was uh, announced by the scientists, right? Well, I have a friend. You know him. It's Greg. He his his porch faces due south, and like clockwork, before the earthquake, he knew exactly when high noon was because of the vertical slats in his uh, railing. Okay. Yep. It's 15 minutes off now. Yep. And our area up here, it's uh, northeast Washington, it's it's like a, a nuclear winter. I mean, we just had snow again yesterday. Yep. This is almost May. It's, yep. uh, it's quite bizarre what's going on. 
Well, you know, we're going through a period of change. 